Hi, thanks very much. Well, we have had an incredible two days, um, and I don't want it to end here, but I, you know, this afternoon is really all about the question of what do we do given the situation? And, you know, we heard from Steve Weiss that one way to make it right, undo the wrongs, is uh, through recognizing the rights of non-human animals and enforcing that in the legal structure. And Steve talked about the fact that, you know, in order to be successful at these kinds of uh, efforts, there has to be somewhere for the animals to go because unfortunately, we are not in a position to turn back time and we can't just take animals and drop them in the wild and expect them to survive. What I'm going to talk about today is restitution and specifically sanctuaries as restitution. Our relationship with other animals and our trajectory as a species has been one of increasingly distancing ourselves from the, uh, the rest of nature. And the increasing exploitation of the other animals until we're at the point where we basically see them and use them as not just objects, but disposable objects. And to illustrate what I see as, you know, sort of this trajectory that our species has been on, if you look on the left, you see the famous March of Human Evolution. And this comes in many forms, but it kind of all kind of looks like this, right? You start with a chimpanzee or an ape-like creature, and you start getting more and more upright, 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 until you finally get to us. And as, as if evolution had a mind and was trying all this time to finally get to us, and then once it did, ooh, I made it. Um, I also want to point out some of the morphological features of this march of evolution, and in particular, the increasingly lighter skin of each step along the evolutionary way. That's not a coincidence, okay? Because you know what? I've seen a lot of these. They all look like that. All right, there's just some, you know, there are hidden biases even in, in books that depict human evolution that are supposed to be science books that tell us what we really think of other animals and other humans. And this is a, the latest one. This is because, you know, now we're into this post human, this transhumanistic view that, you know, after the biological human, we're going to go all robot. And, you know, we're going to be, you know, uploaded and, and all of this stuff, and we're not going to die anymore. And, and this particular book it says it all, the title, Beyond Human, From Animality to Transhumanism. So there's a big segment of society that is pushing this trajectory, and it is a trajectory that I believe has led to the situation that we're in now. The fact is, is that we are now at the point we, where we are engaged in what can only be described as grotesque efforts that represent objectification and commoditization of other animals. On the bottom left, what you see there is a chimera. This is a fetus, an embryo rather, and it's mainly a pig. The red part is human. So now we can make pig humans. Why? 
so that we can grow those pigs up, kill them, take their organs, and put them into humans. So now animals have become living containers for organs. On the upper right, you see the latest in factory farming of chickens. And these chickens are featherless. And the reason they're genetically engineered to be featherless is to save us time, processing time, so that we no longer have to pluck the feathers. We can just have the chicken be born featherless, and it just saves us a lot of time and money. Other animals are disposable. And by that, I mean that when they become inconvenient, then we start to employ practices under the euphemisms of things like culling, managing, and controlling. On the bottom left is a Time Magazine article about America's pest problem, deer. There's too many deer. So let's have open hunting season on them. All of a sudden, deer are pests. Another, uh, another season, they may not be pests. How can the same animal be a pest or not a pest? The label of pests is, means open season. And on the upper right is uh, something that's probably familiar to all of you, which is a recent photograph from a Danish zoo where they had a, a young giraffe who was killed. Why was he killed? He wasn't killed because he was terminally ill or he was violent. He was killed because he was surplus. And if you think this only happens in other countries, you're wrong. Here's another recent example. There's now a price on the head of millions of uh, kangaroos. Uh, the New South Wales government has declared open season on them and insists its cull quota is sustainable. When you hear the word sustainable, you really, you really have to think about it. It may be sustainable from a numbers point of view, but not from the individual's point of view and the individuals who are going to be shot and killed. Here's a story from just two days ago. A zoo in Japan, they killed, they call it culling, they murdered. 57 snow monkeys, because they weren't pure snow monkeys. They had some invasive macaque genes in them. They thought they were all macaca fuscata, and they turned out to be part macaca mulata. So they killed them. We've been hard at work for decades using numbers-based traditional conservation methods to try to manage, to try to control wild populations. We know now that that is an unmitigated disaster. Here's one example of one of those disasters, the catastrophe that was deemed the sustainable African elephant cull, where years ago there were too many African elephants, and what that translates into, there's too many where there are humans, and so they become pests, they become inconvenient. And so they decided, based upon the numbers, how many could be killed, and the population still be sustainable. And the catastrophe that unfolded for the elephants, because of this, is described in Gay Bradshaw's book, Elephants on the Edge, What Animals Teach Us About Humanity. Because lo and behold, it turns out that other animals are not numbers. They're not populations. They're not species. They're individuals. And one elephant is not interchangeable with the other. So it is equivalent to 
the fact that you have a family of five children and a mother, and you take out one of the kids. It's horrible, but the family is going to continue. But if you take out the mother, what's going to happen to those kids? The idea is that there are different roles in society for humans, and the same is true for other, many other social animals. It's not the same. An elephant isn't just an elephant. And I think this is eloquently stated in one of my favorite quotes from Carl Safina. Population numbers tell you what is at stake. But the real question is who is at stake? And if we don't take into account who, we're going to have a problem. Here's a graph of uh, human population and the extinction crisis over time. And on this axis, you see time, extinction on the left, population of humans on the right. The purple line is human population in the millions. And that has gone up, obviously, not just steadily, but quite steeply. And you can see the green line is the number of species extinctions, right? So we are in a mass extinction event. Now, how do we respond to this situation? With all due respect to people who are working so hard on welfare, and I work on welfare too, everybody, you know, welfare is extremely important, but do we actually think that more welfare regulations are going to do it, or larger cages are going to do it, or more humane ways to kill are going to do it? or more management of wild populations is going to do it. I see these things as all part of the problem. Because each one of these efforts frames the existence of non-human animals in relation to our own species. Yes, they can have larger cages as long as we can still confine them and eat them. Yes, they should be killed by injection instead of gassing, but that's because there's too many of them, and so on. More welfare regulations. OK, so monkeys need to have water every few hours, every six hours in the laboratory instead of every eight. But we're still going to use them. And so that is the welfare view that we can use other animals, and we just have to be as nice as we possibly can to them while we're using them. What I'm interested in is what can we do to create a qualitative shift in our relationship with other animals? And I came up with the notion of restitution. Now, restitution is a concept that's been used in many contexts, but not typically used when referring to non-human animals. It's usually referring to when one human group has done wrong to another human group and is trying to give back something that they took from that group. It's the restoration of something lost or stolen to its proper owner. It's recompense for injury or loss. It's the restoration of something to its original state. And I propose that this concept of restitution is a very powerful way to look at how we might relate to the other animals given everything we've taken from them. And I'm going to talk about one specific form of that, and that is sanctuary. And we touched upon this in the last talk. Uh, well, I'm going to say a lot more about it. What is a sanctuary? Well, you're not going to develop a sanctuary unless you think that the well-being of individuals is important. Because no one is going to save a species or a population by setting up a sanctuary. 
But what you are going to do is two things. You're going to make life better for certain individuals who have had their life negatively impacted by our species. And you have got to acknowledge that they have a life that can go poorly or well, depending upon how it goes. And I use this definition of sanctuary from the Performing Animal Welfare Society. Um, PAWS is an elephant sanctuary up in California. Their work is stunning, beautiful, and um, you know they've taken in not just elephants, but many, many other animals rescued from circuses and zoo, roadside zoos and so forth. And so this is their definition of what a real sanctuary is. First of all, a wildlife sanctuary is a place of refuge where abused, injured, and abandoned captive wildlife may live in peace and dignity for the remainder of their lives. So sanctuaries aren't the same as rescue operations, rescue and rehab and release operations necessarily. In sanctuaries, you don't breed. So if you ever go somewhere and they call themselves the wild cat sanctuary and they're breeding the animals, it's not a sanctuary, it's a zoo dressed up like a sanctuary. The last thing you want to do is make more individuals in captivity. And there should be no exploitation for commercial purposes. Again, if you go somewhere and they say you can take a picture with the tiger, it is not a sanctuary. It is a zoo. A true sanctuary respects the integrity of individual animals providing safe, healthy, and secure refuge in enclosures, and yes, it is still captivity, specifically designed for the unique animal which it supports. But the key here is that in a sanctuary, it's all about the animals. The well-being of the residents is the priority. It is not about the visitor experience. It is not about anything else, it is about those individuals and how, what you can do to give back to them what, as much as possible of what has been taken from them by the entertainment industry. Sanctuaries require two shifts in our perspectives. One, Acknowledging that the quality of one's life matters to other animals. Acknowledging that they are someone, not something. A population or a species is a thing. The individuals who make up those metrics are someones. And what you do to that population or that species doesn't have an, an abstract implication, it impacts the real lives of real individuals. And that's what happened with the African culls. They took, the, they took some of the teenage uh, boys away and put them somewhere else, and those, they went, ran amok. They just didn't know how to live because it, they found out that when you're a young elephant, you look to your elders to figure out how to be a proper elephant. So. Without that influence, without that role model, they just ran amok, and it was a disaster. The second, taking a fully non-anthropocentric viewpoint. Again, this is not about us. It is about them. And it means that what you have to do is say, I couldn't care less what's important to me or what I think a good life would be. But if I'm an elephant or a chimpanzee or a dolphin, what would make a good life? Now, we can't ask them, but people who say, oh, we can never know, I think we can get some pretty good guesses. I think we know the kinds of things that are not good and the kinds of things that are generally good, we know. 
But you have to take that viewpoint. I remember um, when the Georgia Aquarium was trying to defend their keeping of beluga whales and dolphins in these little tanks. The owner said something to the effect of, I don't know what the problem is. These beluga whales, they get everything. They get free food, the best medical care you can imagine. What do they want? And Bernie Marcus, the founder of the Georgia Aquarium, actually said that the Georgia Aquarium was like the Hilton of aquariums, which betrays an incredible ignorance about who you are keeping captive. Now, it's really important because we've been talking about mass extinctions to bring these things together because I truly believe that captivity and extinction are not separate problems. They are part of the same problem of objectifying, commoditizing, and exploiting other animals. It's not like we treat animals great in one area and terrible in another area. We treat them the same no matter what. Here's some examples. On the left, you see um, an orca, member of the southern resident orcas from the Salish Sea off of Washington. They are now endangered. Why are they endangered? There's lots of reasons. Lack of food, boat noise, but they have also not yet recovered from the captures for marine parks in the 60s and 70s. It had such an impact upon that population, just they, they just couldn't get a foothold. So now they're facing no food, boat traffic, and they're going down. There's about you know, 70 left. It's, it's very on the edge. Asian elephants, endangered. Why? Habitat loss, human elephant conflict. And believe me, when there's human elephant conflict, the elephant loses. And chimpanzees, our closest cousins, endangered. Why? Habitat loss, poaching for meat, and captures for the pet and display industry. So the common thread there is that all of these members of these species are endangered, not just for reasons that have to do with traditional habitat loss and, and so forth and human, quote, human animal conflict, they're also taken for captivity. So it's all part of the same process. So now I'd like to tell you a little bit about the project that I've been involved with, with a number of folks who are actually here in this room, and that is our whale sanctuary project. Now we know that there are sanctuaries for many kinds of animals. Um, there are many elephant sanctuaries. There are many chimpanzee sanctuaries, including one up here in northern Georgia. And there are even sanctuaries for marine mammals. But there are none for dolphins and whales. But that is about to change. First thing I want to talk about is the fact that we are not the only ones. A couple of years ago, the National Aquarium in Baltimore announced that they were taking their the dolphins that they hold on display, taking them out of the shows, and are building a sanctuary for them where they can transport them to a life that goes from that, that's actually the Georgia Aquarium, and that, to that, okay? So they are looking now for a sanctuary site somewhere in Florida or the Bahamas where these warm water dolphins, I think they have eight dolphins, um, can be transported and can live their life with much more dignity than they currently have. We are focusing on a couple of other species of marine mammals, orcas and belugas. Why? Because orcas suffer the worst well-being and the highest mortality of all cetaceans in captivity. Does anybody know who this is? Lolita. Take a look at her tank. She's been in that tank for decades, all alone, from the point of view of having no other orcas, 
but once in a while they throw a blow up doll of an orchid in there. She does shows several times a day with people jumping on her and standing on her and she's almost blind now from all the chlorine and all of the stuff in the water. She's in her 40s and there's really nothing to say about this. Belugas are a very second, close second in terms of mortality and poor well-being. So here are some of the things that happen to orcas and belugas in concrete tanks. Poor physiological conditioning and physical problems. Diseases related to mental stress. Immune system dysfunction. Behavioral stereotypies, meaning rep repetitive, nonsensical behaviors. Hyperaggression. Poor parenting skills, right? If you grow up in a closet, you're not going to know how to be a parent, especially if you're a socially complex, member of a socially complex species. And so guess what? Your kids are going to die, and that's what happens. That happened left and right in the George Aquarium, uh, where Maris, the beluga, lost two kids, and then she died. Do we know why? No. Increased mortality rates, lowered survivorship, significantly shorter lifespan. This amounts to a lack of thriving. This is very much like, you know, what happened to orphan babies in Russia when there, you know, there were no parents around and they had a lot of babies, infants, and they all put them, they put them in cribs and they fed them and they were dying left and right because they could not thrive under those conditions. Humans cannot thrive just on being fed. We need other things, social input, affection, other things. Those infants were dying because of lack of thriving, and the infant dolphins and whales in captivity are dying for the same exact reasons. So here we are, the Whale Sanctuary Project. Our mission is to establish a permanent seaside sanctuary where orcas and belugas can live in an environment that maximizes well-being and autonomy and is as close as possible to their natural habitat. And so you see that the concepts there is of a permanent seaside sanctuary where we're not saying that we can give them back everything we took from them. We cannot, but we can get as close as possible. And I submit that part of restitution is trying to get as close as possible. You may not get there, but you have to try. So here's our concept. We're going to create a cold water natural environment for about five to eight individuals. We will do rescue and rehab of wild individuals. We want to have a global reach. We want this to be internationally known as a model for how we might begin to relate to these animals. We will offer world-class veterinary and scientific practices, authentic public education and outreach. And we are, we're going to have a visitor center, and we're going to do that in a way that respects the autonomy, the privacy, the dignity of the residents. And we are actually going to offer something that no zoo or aquarium can offer, authenticity. Authenticity in what we say to the public. Because when you go to SeaWorld or you go to a zoo, they are invested in making sure that you feel good about being there. That you go away thinking you've done good, you're a good person, the animals are happy. And so in order to do that, they have to lie to you. We won't have to do that will be able to tell people that come to visit why these animals are there, who they are, and why they really should be 
in nature instead of where they are. So we have nothing to hide. And that, I think, is key to our ability to shift this relationship from one of exploitation of these animals to one of authenticity, transparency, and, and respect. And again, we are going to share all of our information. This is just a, a very high level concept drawing um, of what we're going to do. It makes it look like we're just going to go into any cove and throw a volleyball net across it. It's not going to be that easy. Um, it actually involves a whole team of people, um, and not just people in animal care and training, but also marine mammal scientists, people who operate sanctuaries and manage sanctuaries, people who know how to do stuff like this, policy and regulatory compliance, public education and outreach. We're going to eventually have hiring, hiring educators and people who know how to do outreach and education, business development, PR, marketing, um, site selection, design and engineering. We will have an on-site visitor center. Um, we will have visitor tours, but I'm taking as our model sanctuaries like PAWS, like Performing Animal Welfare Society, where, you know, it's at a respectful distance. If the residents don't want to hang out with you, there's enough space for them to go. We're going to have internship programs for veterinary students and animal care students and community outreach. And we are also going to do something very high tech. I've been talking with a lot of companies who are very interested in using interactive virtual reality displays and immersion techniques um, to create an experience for visitors when they come. And this allows people to still feel a connection with the animals, but it is not at their expense. Where are we looking? We're looking in Nova Scotia and Maine on the, on the East Coast, British Columbia and Washington on the West Coast. And by the fall, we will have a site picked out this year. And if we keep going and we get enough support to continue at the, the pace we've been going, we will be able to open the first sanctuary by 2019 or 2020. So what I see the sanctuary as is an opportunity, an opportunity to do some of the things that were talked about by the folks that Michael mentioned, you know, this idea of giving back, of doing whatever we can to give back what we took. We are not the only project or organization that are making these shifts. The Non-Human Rights Project is certainly one of them. There's a compassionate conservation organization that's, that's doing that, the Someone Not Something Project, the fact that we've gotten rid of elephants and circuses, the National Institutes of Health decision to take chimpanzees off the table in terms of invasive research, the no-kill movement, and um, a project that I, I spoke at at NYU called Seeing Seafood as Animals. Because when you hear the word seafood, you don't even see animals you, or individuals. You see this abstract term that means something in Red Lobster or something. But what they were trying to get at is, let's have a conversation about the fact that being a fish is being an animal. So I'm just going to thank you, and we'll look forward to talking about this further. Thank you. It's discussion time. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> and uh, let's welcome Andrew Fenton. Andrew is assistant professor in the Department of Philosophy at Dalhousie University, and his research efforts include animal ethics, animal cognition and behavior, and the philosophy of uh, autism. 
Great. Uh, hi, everybody. I just wanted to actually thank uh, Michael, Laurie, and John for such a great symposium. Um, it's uh, here we go. And thanks, thanks for everybody being here. It's actually really nice to be in a room with uh, like minds, um, even with all our diversity. So let's let's chat. Okay. Um, so <laughs> here's here's one of the things that I worry about about uh, sanctuaries, and it's not it doesn't. Uh, and thank you to everybody working in sanctuaries, including mm -hmm. including what you're doing with the with the whale sanctuary, uh, and that has to do with funding. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, there's there's many ways to frame sanctuaries. So you can do it in terms of, as you say, restitution. I think Karen Emmerman is uh, recommending that we do it in moral repair, and I'll get back to that in a second, just to ask you about that. Uh, we could do it in terms of societal debt, um, because uh, for uh, orcas, um, you know, the, these, these animals are used in entertainment, uh, quasi-education, education. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they, we, we have robbed them of a lot. Um, and so there's a sense of societal debt, because I, 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 myself, I worry that uh, too many sanctuaries uh, depend on donations, when in fact I think uh, we should be taking it quite seriously as a society that we should be providing the funds for these sanctuaries. And so there's my first talking point with you is funding. I, I, um, I haven't heard a lot of discussion uh, about this, and I think there could be a fairly simple argument put forward, um, mm -hmm. including on, on the basis of societal debt. Um, uh, that we as a society yeah. owe these animals a chance to live out the rest of their life uh, in the way that you and others are envisioning, and we should pay for it. I agree. I mean, seriously, yeah, we, we should. And in the spirit of restitution, when one group of people has wronged another group of people, everybody pays up and yes we've used these animals for entertainment ruin their lives and each one of us all of us really should be paying back to them now in an ideal world we would all have the kind of sensibility that would allow that to happen but unfortunately there are still people who are going to these venues to see people riding on top of orcas and going to dolphin shows and riding on dolphins because they think it's going to cure autism and this, that, and the other thing. So as long as there are a significant number of people who think that way, the, 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 the road to getting societal restitution for these animals is a long road to hope. Um, but the issue of funding is critically important because when you have a sanctuary, you're taking on a tremendous responsibility. And yes, most sanctuaries are nonprofit. They rely upon donations. Um, and they're constantly working on donations to be sustainable. You know, before we take the first individual in, Recognizing we may have to care for that individual for 10, 20, 30 years, right? We better have a lot of the money up front because once they're there, they're there. And you are responsible and you better be able to take care of them. Mm -hmm. So here's, here's Karen Emmerman's worries about uh, moral repair versus restitution. I, I don't think this is at all a criticism of what you're doing here. And I think. Uh, it's it, here's here's the, the the change of gaze. So, with with restitution, there is the sense of you say because of the meaning of the term that we we give we, we make efforts to give back what we've taken. Um, but part of the problem, and this would be true of elephants, it's true of uh, chimpanzees, it would be true of macaques, uh, be true of of course of orcas and, and dolphins, is with uh, intensely social animals. That is animals where. They don't get the appropriate uh, social environment. Uh, they do not develop well. They mm -hmm. they do not develop as complete beings, mm -hmm. um, much like humans. Mm -hmm. um, we can't give back what we have taken from them. I mean, there's no, there is no way to uh, artificially induce an environment uh, where they could then regain what they've lost, because they'll they'll never know what they lost That's because right. they lost it. Um, we might be aware of what they lost, although only in a shadow, because we're still getting to know these animals. And so 
and that includes elephants and chimpanzees and macaques. And so for Karen Emmerman, she favors moral repair because it changes the gaze. It's, it's, a, it's, it's an acknowledgement that we can't give them back uh, what we've taken, but it's also an acknowledgement um, and an aspiration to heal. And so a heal, heal our relationships with them, mm -hmm. uh, heal the animals that have suffered. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's the rehabilitation uh, mm -hmm. aspect, but it changes the gaze, right? So it's, mm -hmm. a, I mean, if you think of you know, a, a visitor center where they come and you're talking to children or families right. uh, about, about the whales, th this change of gaze means that it's not about giving back because we can, it's about repairing, mm -hmm. repairing what we can of what we've damaged while acknowledging that we'll, they'll never have what we have robbed them of. That's really well put, and I completely agree. Um, yeah, we can never give back to them what we have taken from them. Just like we're never going to give back to any of the non-human animals what we've taken from them anywhere. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. Um, and some of it is irreparable. Um, I like the way you put it, and I would totally agree with okay. that concept. Okay. Uh, here's uh, something else that comes out of Emmerman's work, so I'll throw that out because I want to get back to the anthropocentrism at some point because sure. uh, it's a really important concept and yeah. I like what you're doing with it. Um, so uh, there's three, three concerns that she has about sanctuaries um, and she says this in full sympathy with sanctuaries. Um, I, don't, I don't think any right-minded person could be anything but sympathetic and mm -hmm. unsighted about sanctuaries. Um, but she's worried about uh, the nature of confinement that has come up and uh, mm -hmm. what you were acknowledging. Is, is, and of course, I don't know. I, I, we've been, been a supporter of Fauna Foundation uh, mm -hmm. since the mid-90s when they really got their, their chimpanzees from the lens up. Mm -hmm. um, but they're well aware that these animals are, are behind fences and bars and, and always will be. Yeah. Um, there's the issues of boredom and, and enrichment. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's, there's finally issues around uh, expression of, of natural activities, like reproduction, right? right. So uh, having families, being parents. Right. Um, and so just, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think that you've uh, touched upon some of the ways that we cannot recreate a natural life in a sanctuary. Um, and that's all part of the picture of the fact that we cannot completely give them back everything that was taken from them. Uh, in the case of, of social animals, right, like elephants, uh, orcas, chimpanzees, you're going to try to do your best to get as close as possible to something resembling social interaction. Um, it will never be like it should be yeah. in the wild. Just, it just, there's no way to recreate that. Yeah. Um, so I think that while those things are true about sanctuaries, um, we also have to keep in mind that the difference between, for instance, a sanctuary and where those animals are coming from, laboratories, roadside zoos, concrete tanks, that there's a, a universe of difference there. And they're going from one place where the animal, those individuals, are not the priority. Selling tickets is the priority. And then whatever you can do for the animals within that framework, great. To a world where everybody's there just to give you everything they could possibly give you so that you could live a good life. Is it enough? Not nearly. But it's a lot better than where they are. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, I think it's, a, it's a nice, nicely put to actually show the pictures if have a look at the, the, the state of captivity that this elephant is and then have a look at, at uh, this elephant in freedom, I mean, or yeah. in the relative freedom of, of a sanctuary. I think right. it's, a, I guess, an important, a important contrast. Juxtaposition of images. Speaking as a philosopher and not an, <laughs> uh, someone working in art or the fine arts. So let's, let's go to uh, anthropocentrism, because this is a gnarly issue. It's really difficult, and we all struggle with it. Uh, yeah. All of us on our intellectual journeys have struggled with anthropocentrism. and. Uh, there are a number of sites that are very complex. The way we talk about ourselves is very complex. Yeah. So, um, 
you know, we have a tendency to talk um, as if uh, humans are all neurotypicals. That's been happening, right? I mean, we talk about how we mental time travel. Um, that is, we can think in terms of what we'll do two years from now. Mm -hmm. um, but so, not everybody can do that. Exactly, right? and exactly. That's the point. And so, and so, and and you know, there's a real, there's a real. I mean, that's lurking in all of a whole bunch of discourse that goes on, even in contexts like this where we're very mm -hmm. resistant to anthropocentrism. Is we still have these echoes of human supremacy that that foreground certain things that are that are neurotypical, but by no means um, representative of the diversity of our species. Right. Um, and, and this brings up a, a really important issue, and that is anthropocentrism, one of the roles of anthropocentrism that makes this complicated is it allowed us to, to re-see members of our community that we were very resistant to see as equals, and still are. Yeah. So um, <coughs> Stephen has been talking about the history of uh, chattel slavery uh, in in North America, you can talk about um, the breakthroughs for uh, women's rights, and there's still a long way to go um, because women still do not make an uh, equal dollar for an equal uh, equal work, uh, and a lot of their work that's unpaid is not recognized. Mm -hmm. uh, we've still a long way to go with children, mm -hmm. um, but in all those in all those mo moments, and of course with folks who are differently able, so folks on the autism spectrum, uh, folks who uh, say have Down syndrome. Uh, folks who are paraplegic or quadriplegic. Sure. And one of the things that anthropocentrism uh, allows uh, as a possibility, as an imaginary, is uh, retuning our moral gaze. Now, it can't, of course, we know it can't do everything, and right. it can do too much, because, of course, if, you're, if you were a consistent anthropocentrist, you would be against uh, abortion, for instance, because embryos and early fetuses are still members of our species. Mm -hmm. And I think that, was a, as a person committed to the reproductive uh, rights of women, I think that would be a serious error. And so it can do too much. And of course, people who are anthropocentrists are often very inconsistent about this. Well, but that, but this, this, Balancing yeah. a lot of different Yeah, things. yeah. But it allows for this re-seeing. And so as we move to a non-anthropocentric non lens, um, I can imagine uh, people that I write about or interact with who are, say, on the autism spectrum, very worried about, these are very vulnerable populations where their status in our communities is still in transition. Well, and so, right. so what do we, what do we, how do we actually embrace a non-anthropocentrism without losing those hard-won victories? And particularly given that we're still in transition, this is really sure, you know, sure. And everything you're saying is correct. I mean, this is all part of the same thing. I don't think, though, that adopting a non-anthropocentric stance means abandoning right. the stance of other human beings. I mean, I think what I'm talking about is something very almost practical and applied, meaning that if I'm going to be building a sanctuary for beluga whales or orcas, I have to think like an orca or beluga whale. Um, mm -hmm. And so that means that the things that I or other people might think would be wonderful ways to, I mean, none of that applies. Uh, living in the Hilton, I mean, those kinds of things, ridiculous, yeah. right? Yeah. So I don't see that as in any way challenging to notions that we need to be mindful of the fact that no population is homogeneous, no population of non-human animal and no population of human animals. So I don't, I don't think it threatens that, at least in my view it doesn't. Okay, can I ask one more question? Just, yeah. So, so as a philosopher, because um, yep. you know we're a mixed bunch. We're a conservative bunch, if folks haven't noticed that. <laughs> it's not so much here, and I don't mean that <laughs> as a disparaging comment about any philosophers here, but we are, as a, whole, as a community, yeah. uh, fairly conservative. And, and so uh, there's a question of how can we be more helpful as uh, philosophers who see ourselves as scholar activists yeah. or, or as scholar advocates. Um, because moral philosophy is a very gnarly space to work, and we tend to gravitate towards metrics in ethical analysis that continue to favor humans. And this will be true in Tom Reagan's work, this will be true in Peter Singer's work. Because uh, it's very easy to say, well, listen, if you're doing a harm analysis, uh, when there's conflicting interests, of course we can harm ourselves more than them. Because think of how we ex how we metacognize. Think of, yeah, yeah. you know, think of the ways that we can nest thoughts about ourselves and the harm that would be done if right. we harm ourselves. And so it looks very suspiciously like we we consistently gravitate towards cooking the books in one form or another. 
And I worry about this myself because yeah. I, I don't want to do that myself. I want to yeah, resist yeah. that. So how could philosophers be more helpful, do you think? Oh, my gosh. Well, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I think that one way that philosophy can be helpful is by helping us navigate through some of the concepts and ideas that we're putting forth and making sure that you know um, our logic is consistent, that um, that we are, you know, actually thinking straight about some of these things, but also just from a very practical point of view, you know, there are a lot of philosophers who, you know, are philosophers, uh, but they are still willing to get their hands dirty and get in there and say, look, you know, yeah, it's just morally wrong to keep an orca in a concrete tank. Yeah, here are my academic arguments, but I'm, I'm going to be off here, you know, trying to raise money for the sanctuary so we can put a couple of orcas in there, a couple of chimpanzees or elephants. Um, so I think that if you want to be on the ground, you can be on the ground, but this notion of practical ethics, very important, and I would like to see more philosophers go from up here somewhere to down here and ask that same question that you asked. It's like, what can I do um, as a philosopher? And th there's plenty. Thanks. Um, I just have a question about um, your plans for the sanctuary. Um, in, when I lived in Florida, I was involved with the wolf sanctuary. Um, most of those animals, unfortunately, had come from like black market mm -hmm. type situations. And they had a you know, struggled sometimes finding ways to allow naturally social beings to build social relationships with each other when they didn't have the opportunity to learn. Yes. And ended up injuring each other at, you know. Yeah. And I just wondered how you planned on dealing with that just out of curiosity. Yeah, I mean, that's very important. It's like, well, you know, you, if they're naturally social beings, you want them to be together. The problem is that you have to recognize that just being a social animal doesn't mean just living with a bunch of others, conspecifics. That's the mistake we make. It's a mistake we made with the cull culling of the African elephants. One's as good as the other, or yeah, workers are social beings. Let's throw a bunch of them in the same enclosure and watch them go. Um, Catherine knows it doesn't work for elephants. It's a question of asking who is going to be with who? What are their histories? What is their relationship to each other? Given that, we're going to try our hardest to recreate a part of that social milieu. For instance, one of the ways that we can do that is by trying to get residents who have already bonded or already formed their own social group at an aquarium. And, and let them stay together, not separate them, right? But at the same time, if, we, you know, if two individuals are from completely different places and are strangers to each other, just because they're social animals, we're not going to assume that they're going to get along, they're individuals, we're going to play it safe and, and have them separated. Now, if things develop where we see an affinity you know, this is not, this is so dynamic and we have to have people like Carol, you know, people who really know dolphins and whales and how they act on the scene, watching them, taking data all the time and making the best scientific judgments they can make about what is the very best thing to do for the animals 24-7, 365. I, um, I really like the idea of the whale sanctuary, and I think that's really important, but I'm a little confused on a few things. Um, sometimes I see whale sanctuaries, if you're putting the individuals, already you, you have people, have these individuals who have lost the connections with their families, for example, and just by moving them somewhere else to, let's say, Nova Scotia or Maine, they may be Pacific whales. Mm -hmm. They may still have families up there that um, they might be able to, um, to reconnect with mm -hmm. 
in a, in a, like a C-pan situation. And uh, like Springer, I'm sure you know yes, Springer, yes. Who, they, who was a, a lost orca, who because they know who the, the matriline was, that they kept him in a, rehabbed her, kept her in a C-pen, reintroduced him with, with the families as they naturally passed, yeah. released her, she's now back with her family and has produced two calves in the right. wild. Yes. Um, I don't know if you can, but I'm not sure you could do that with Lolita, even though you know the families, or Corky, you know the families. That would be nice. But I'm just concerned that you're going to be moving, the, recreating a little bit of the same conditions you have in the social group by moving them someplace else where it's not the same prey, it's not the, you know, the salmon versus maybe a north, uh, an Atlantic orca would, would be in to herring. Um, why aren't you maybe, there's another scope of maybe doing this, these kind of sea pens like, like Springer in the uh, BC area um, for some of those whales? Am I making well, some sense? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're not, I mean, we are considering all of those factors. This is a very, very complex project and we have to consider many, many factors and then just make a decision and monitor whether that's the right decision. And one of the factors that goes into deciding who's a candidate for the, for the uh, sanctuary is one, where is that sanctuary? What are the wild populations around there? Um, who might come in, what their age is, their health status, so forth, but also, you know, um, will they be able to possibly communicate with their natal group, you know, that they were taken from when they were like three or four years old. And that can be a good or bad thing, and it just depends on, you know, uh, what we think might happen. We're, we're very conservative. Um, we're not just going to dump them back in there in the ocean and watch them swim away with their families. That's not going to happen. Um, but at the same time, we're not going to prevent their development if we see that, for instance, Corky goes up and we're up in British Columbia and her family, her natal group comes by and they're communicating. We're not going to hold her back, but we're not going to just open the gates on the second day and say, swim free. So all of these kinds of factors are, you know, will keep us up at night, but then there's no answer. You just have to try to make the best guess you can about what is the right combination of individuals and not just who's inside the enclosure but who's outside the enclosure too. Are you, are you looking at just one uh, situation or are you going to offer support maybe individual ones like maybe taking a court or someone like maybe younger and putting them back in the natural well, that's what we're doing. I mean, that's what we're doing. And, and this is not about the visitors. This is about the animals, giving, getting them to as close as possible to a natural situation that we can. The visitors are there because it's an opportunity for us to shift our relationships so that maybe, just maybe, people will stop going to these circuses to see these animals in concrete tanks. Um, and two, we have to be sustainable in some way. So we have to find some way of keeping everything going. Um, so there have to be visitors and tours and all of that, but it's going to be very much unlike what a normal zoo or aquarium would be. Well, I had this fantasy when Andrew raised his question about social responsibility in terms of sustainability. Long history, but tobacco companies had to pay large fines that now um, fund anti-smoking campaigns, um, health care, etc. Does anybody in this group foresee that maybe in the future SeaWorld, Georgia Aquarium, etc. might be fined to um, support such things as your wonderful project? Thank you, and I'm glad you mentioned that because our project is not about closing down SeaWorld or the Georgia Aquarium or anything. Our project is about building a sanctuary 
Um, and whatever way we can do that, we'll do that. And uh, the, 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 the zoos and, and, uh, and aquariums of the world know that we stand ready to work with them. Um, the best thing that could happen is if SeaWorld says to us at some point, you know what, yeah, it's a good idea, but you know, we'd like to join you or we'd like to do it, you know, great, fabulous. That's what this is all about. Um, whether we could ever force them to pay, I don't know. That's a legal question. Um, we're holding out our hands and saying, before it gets really ugly for you, how about you join us? Because we'd be happy to work with you. Can I, can I jump in there? For yeah, a just, just for a question with that inter interaction. Uh, so another thing uh, Karen uh, Eberman uh, worries about, as well as Will Kimlicka and Sue Donaldson, are sanctuaries that give the, give the impression that w with the important work that everyone is doing, that society gets off the hook. And if you, and if you start working with places like SeaWorld, are you worried that uh, there might be mixed messages that come out of uh, such a relationship? That's a good question. And some, some rights, I mean, some activists will say, Ugh, how could you even talk to the people at SeaWorld? You know, I th again, it's not about me. It's not about them. It's about what can you do to make life better for these animals? Um, and I think as long as you hold to your principles um, that um, we have to put aside differences and histories, um, yeah, we, we don't, the mission cannot be diluted. But if you hold to the mission and hold to the principles and somebody wants to join in on that and help with that for whatever reason, that's, that's great in my view. Um, and I know like the Performing Animal Welfare Site, they work with zoos all the time. There are people on our advisory group who are, on, who are members of the zoo community. Um, again, it's not about us. That's what I'd say. Hi. Um, this is more of an observation that I had based off some things that you showed in your PowerPoint. But you mentioned how um, here in the United States we see deer as pests. And I mean, in another part of the world, we're also seeing in Australia how the kangaroos are pests. I mean, they're being hunted, killed, killed hit with cars, even eaten. Mm -hmm. And so it's a matter of fact of how humans are viewing these overpopulated species as pests, when in reality, we seem to be the biggest pests of all invading into their <laughs> territory is what I'm noticing, and it's come to a controversy that we really only seem to want to help certain populations of species once they hit the term endangered or threatened. And it seems to be an issue that we should really start before the problem arises, rather than when it already happens. Yeah. But even when they back up from being endangered, like the Florida manatees, they backed up and they called them threatened. Yeah. Um, the, the boater, uh, people who go out on boats and stuff already want to start changing the policies that were made to protect the manatees by changing the uh, boating speed limits and making it, increasing it and yep. that way to make a more tourist area too by like allowing people to swim in areas where manatees had gathered. Yeah, I get, I get your point. I mean, John, Shaki and I were talking about this in the car uh, the other day, how we think that we are so smart and we have these quote, big frontal lobes, and we can think ahead. But in fact, <laughs> that's really not the case. We, uh, we wait till everything gets to be a crisis, and then we run around saying, oh my god, what are we going to do? But by then, it's too late, and we're losing species because of that. Um, it's the same thing as you know when nobody puts in another traffic light until somebody has an accident and is killed, right? That's what we do. That's our psychology. I wish I could say that it was different. I don't think it is. Okay, so uh, I just uh, wanted to make a comment and then ask a question. I appreciated your wince uh, at the term sustainability because I've noticed the use of that term uh, being used to equivocate between being environmentally sustainable and being economically sustainable. Mm -hmm. And yes. of course, environmental sustainability uh, does not treat um, animals as, as individuals, right? It always treats them as fungible, right? The conservation yeah. ecology stuff. 
And so you find people using the term sustainability as a, a kind of a, a moral um, honorific, right? We're sustainable. But when you actually push it at all, they actually mean economically sustainable, which means they're just commercially exploiting whatever they're doing. And so it's uh, a kind of fascinating um, rhetorical maneuver that's happening in a lot of discussions around these kinds of things. So I, I appreciated your wince with the term sustainable. The question I have is about the transformation of zoos. Uh, and so, uh, do you think there is a possibility, um, because the, the conceptualization, the self-conceptualization of zoos has changed over the last hundred years from being, uh, you know, kind of freak show type colonial mm -hmm. things to being these educational things to being these conservation things, and if there's a kind of infrastructure in a lot of zoo spaces that could be used for sanctuaries. Do you think there's a possibility for transformation? Or yeah. is it just too poisonous? I think that's an excellent uh, question. First of all, I would, I would disagree with the notion that zoos have um, sort of transformed themselves over and over the past 100 years. What they've done is change their patina. The, the sign that they put up. So everybody's interested in entertainment. We're an entertainment facility. Everyone's interested in conservation. We do conservation. If, if we, everyone's interested in education, yeah, we educate. But that has all been a very superficial type of almost signage change. You know, um, they have they fundamentally entertainment facilities, and that's what they are at rock bottom. Now, with that said. I think that there are many people in the zoo industry and aquarium industry who get that their days are numbered and they are trying to make a transformation, a real transformation. Um, part of that is giving up animals that they know they can't take care of in that environment. Like Ron Kagan of the Detroit Zoo, the CEO of the Detroit Zoo, he's on our advisory board, he saw that elephants cannot thrive in the kinds of environment that you can give them in a zoo. He sent them to sanctuary, okay? Now, um, what happened? He got punished for that, and they took away their accreditation, and so these are the contingencies in the zoo. But he's back, and he's determined to move into a sanctuary model. And there are many people in the zoo and aquarium industry who are determined to do that. And I think if they are authentically really interested in doing that, we need to help them do that. Um, so I would take them at their word. Um, and the way that they can show that they're authentically interested in doing that is by doing the right thing by the animals. Can I jump into that as well, just to follow up on that quickly? So just to get your perspective on what you were saying about zoos before and connecting it to that. So. Um, in their conservation <coughs> mandate or image, right? Brand. I would say image. Brand. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is this is the um, this is the backdrop for genetic selection and culling of surplus animals. Yes. And of course, this was what was happening with the J Japanese zoo with the with the um, uh, killing of the snow fifty-seven monkeys. snow monkeys because they do it in terms of genetic genetic uh, purity, right? right? Um, how do you have a conversation with zoos as we uh, ask them to re-envision their space as sanctuary to abandon? Because what we know, Letitia and I know from our conversations with some of the zoo people in Toronto, they're very, very sensitive about losing control of their populations. Of course. So it's very difficult balancing act. It's kind of like tough love, right? You, um, you, you have to stick to your principles. You have to tell it like it is. They know that you know that they know that you know that <laughs> this is not right. Everybody knows what's going on here, right? Um, at the same time, you stick to that, but you have to remain open to, com you have to keep the communication open uh, because once you close it, it's closed forever. Um, and a lot of activists, I think, you know, do things that 
so alienate zoos and aquariums, aquariums that there's no way that these places are ever going to budge. In fact, just for spite, they're never going to give up their animals because they've been so antagonized. So one, you have to stick to your principles because they know that you don't want to see these animals in concrete tanks. Keep that on the table, but at the same time, you have got to continue to communicate with them. So I'm going, I just have to say this one thing, I'm going in, I was invited to give a talk for the AZA. Oh my God. You know, their big conference in May. I'm honored to be asked to talk. Everybody there knows that I want to see all these animals out of these cages and concrete tanks. But I respect the fact that they invited me to come and have a conversation. And I'm, by car, I'm going to do it, you know? I mean, so you have, to, you have to give and take. Final question. So um, last summer, I was in Thailand um, kind of volunteering at an elephant sanctuary. And I noticed two major problems. Um, one, there's, there's just an incredible amount of elephant camps there where they ride elephants and they're very exploited and it's really terrible. But another thing is that when I was at the sanctuary, a lot of the land around it was deforested um, to grow corn, which was, as we all know, for the feed um, for animals in factory farming. Um, but I feel like a lot of the animals that are in elephant camps right now, they don't necessarily have a place to go because there's so much deforestation. And especially for elephants, sanctuaries have to be very large for them. So I think that there's like a multi-pronged approach that needs to happen in terms of educating the tourists so that they don't go to these elephant camps and also educating about our food choices. But um, how, how do you think we can help the animals that are right now in the camps? Like, I feel like there's no immediate way to... Oh, there is. There is. And the way is to create sanctuaries in those areas. And there, I have a number of colleagues, including David Castleman, uh, who's a lawyer in, in California, who has a, a sanctuary in Cambodia. Um, so you go to where these animals are being kept, slaves, and you build a sanctuary, and then it becomes an alternative to that. Now, I don't want to make that seem like you know, oh, it's going to be so easy. You build a sanctuary, everyone's going to give up the elephants, the mahouts are going to go do something else and so forth. But at the very least, what you have to do is build an alternative mm -hmm. and show people that there is an alternative and perhaps say to the people that are abusing the animals now, guess what? You can still make a living and do right by these animals. Give them that opportunity. <coughs> they don't want to do that. That's their business. And that's our business. Right. But, so, Laurie and uh, uh, Andrew, thank you very much. Thank you.